Everybody got another review for you. World War II action again. Uh, this time we got Panzer Grenadier Deluxe Tactical World War II Rules. Uh, now this is by the author of the General to Brigade Rule System, the Polyonic Rules. So it's along that same line of rules. It's by David Brown. Uh, let's take a look at it. First of all, it's a hardback, which is really nice. And it's got about, let's see, there's 242 plus pages. Uh, these last pages here are all play sheets and stuff that you can photocopy. Full color. Look at that. So, yeah, there's an impetus track, unit orders, markers. They got a template here and so on. And these are gloss pages. Full color throughout, as you can see here. Uh, there's lots of photographs. World War II action going on. And... There is, in fact, lots of pictures of miniatures, full color. Uh, so the production quality is very high. These are pretty thick pages. I'm not going to tear on you. Uh, one nice feature is it's got this nice little uh, ribbon here in the center of the book. So is that classy or what? I love it. Uh, so you don't lose your page when you're reading the rules. I don't see many rules that include these kind of things. Uh, so it's nice to see. So there you go. It's got one of those, folks. Uh, again, this is World War II. Set of tactical set of rules. Uh, you got a nice little introduction going on there. Uh, this is, by the way, the deluxe edition, which I should point out, which is basically a third edition of the rules. This set of rules has been around three editions now. Uh, and it has changed. It has come a long way, actually. It's, it's a much smoother game, uh, streamlined, uh, than the previous editions. Uh, definitely an improvement in the rules. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's skip past this, get into the index, and check out what is in this set of rules. First thing we're going to get into here is the chapter one, which is all about scales, bases, and dice that you need in the game. Now, like most of the General's Brigade system, you only need basically two or three D6, and you're good to go. Uh, most of the, ro the rolls that you make in this game are with a 2d6 against the target number, and there'll be modifiers on that die roll. Uh, sometimes you do only make a single d6 roll, and that's about it. So it's not a really dice-heavy game. You're not going to be rolling bucket loads of dice with this set of rolls. Uh, and the scale of the figures is basically there's two scales you can play this game with, all right? Uh, figure scale. There's the first scale, which is the primary scale the rules are designed around, which is infantry models represent two to four men each, uh, and a base would equal a section or a squad. Uh, your vehicles, your AFVs, equal two or three actual vehicles. Uh, so one model is basically a section or a troop of uh, vehicles. Uh, and finally, one gun model is two to three guns in representation, which is basically a gun section. Uh, that's the main scale that this set of rules is built around. Uh, your basic units of maneuver will be infantry platoons, tank platoons, uh, <clears throat> made up of like four vehicles or four <clears throat> bases of infantry, excuse me, uh, and so on. So this is a battalion level game, really. That's pretty much what it's designed around. Uh, but there is an alternate basing system that is more in line with the one-to-one -one scale, like Flames of War and Battle Group, where one model equals one model, and that's how it works. So you're going to have tank platoons represented by five or six models, uh, and squads of infantry represented by literally uh, eight to twelve miniature figures. Uh, so there is a section here called Figure Scale 2 that you can play the game that way on a one-to-one -one scale. And there's some rules adjustments to allow that. Uh, another thing is that there is a basing system specific for these rolls. Uh, basically, one-inch square bases with three or two mu figures on them. It's, it's basically a suggestion. It's not essential. In fact, basing is irrelevant in this game. You can use figures that are based individually, mounted for Flames of War, or using the suggestions here. In fact, there is a section in here that mentions using figures mounted for Flames of War. Uh, as you can see here, some of the pictures, for instance, show just that. Got some figures based very similar to Flames of War, uh, and so on. So you don't have to worry about your basing. You could use these figures with your collection uh, of models, uh, whether they're based for I Am and Shot Mom or Flames of War or Battle Group. It doesn't matter. Uh, one other thing is the rules are designed for any scale figures, uh, 15 millimeter, 20 millimeter. You can use these rules with 25 mil uh, or smaller, like 10 mil or micro scale. I use 15 millimeter with this, and it's ideal for me. 
Uh, and the rules uh, mentioned using 15 mil and 20 mil specifically, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use bigger scales. In fact, it talks about using bigger size miniatures or smaller with your games. So that's the basing and that's the figure scale of the game. So now let's get into chapter two, which is all about how your armies are organized. It's all about how your armies are organized. Now, keep in mind that it's basically a battalion level game. You're gonna have multi-companies going at it in these battles that you're gonna fight. And, but it's not called a battalion, it's called a battle group. And basically you will have a number of company commanders uh, in charge of a bunch of platoons of infantry and tanks. And uh, it's basically the equivalent of a double two companies, three companies or larger uh, action. You can play with company level games if you wanted to, and especially if you use the one-to-one -one basing system, uh, you would easily be able to handle company level actions. Uh, but this is pretty much what a typical army would look like, where you've got a bunch of tanks and quite a few infantry. And the number of tanks and bases of infantry that you have determines how many company commanders you have. Now, it's very abstract the way it represents company commanders and uh, the battle group commander. Uh, it's basically based on the number of units of infantry and tanks that you have in your force. That determines how many company commanders you will field. Uh, in general, it's about every 15 bases or vehicles will give you a, a company commander. But that could be different based on nationality and time. It might be a good idea to take a look at this little example here, because this, this pretty much shows you uh, what a basic army will look like and basically you have all these rifle sections with their transport and a platoon command This would be a platoon right here. You got one two three sections uh, Down here. We got the second platoon with its command base a light machine gun section Which is basically like rifles except they have uh, an LMG and you got two more rifle sections And then a third platoon of infantry with again an LMG section and two rifle sections and finally down here, another platoon command, which includes uh, some anti-tank and support weapons, like a medium machine gun, an anti-tank weapon, uh, etc., and some transport. And on top of this, you have some stewards uh, and some recon vehicles, Churchill tanks, uh, with a platoon command as well. So basically we have one, two, three, four, five platoons uh, with some recon ability. And the rest is just command. Now you have your headquarters command, which is the battle group command. If your player has one of these, <clears throat> you get that automatically. Uh, that's your headquarters. That's basically you on the table. And in this case, because there's about 15 or so of these uh, units, it gets one company headquarters base. Uh, and that's what that is. And this is basically an extension in, as far as command is concerned, of your headquarters. So you want to spread them around so you can control more units. Uh, and finally, an artillery observer. Uh, and that's a basic small army, uh, moderate-sized army. But there you go. That's an example of how or what an army will look like in this game. Let's see what's next in this. Now, the next few pages are going to talk about the specific troop types, like the headquarters, the company headquarters, the battle group headquarters, multiplayer games. It talks about this. Here's an important chart that's worth mentioning. Uh, this is basically the number of company HQ bases uh, that you get for every section you have in your army. Now, this doesn't include transport vehicles, but it does include vehicles as well as infantry sections. So, for instance, uh, the Germans of 1939 to 42 do get one company HQ per 12 sections. Now that's, that's quite versatile. That's a lot of company HQ. And like I said, the company HQs in this game are very important because they, they represent your influence on the battlefield. The more of them you have, the more troops you can keep activated and doing things uh, and use your impetus, as I'll get into later, uh, during the game. And again, here we are talking about multiplayer games. Uh, the next sections talk about the various troop types, infantry, tanks, and guns, and how they're represented on the battlefield. Uh, you got your rifle sections, LMG sections, and so on and so forth. Everything you'd expect. Uh, Flamethrowers, anti-tank teams, heavy weapon teams like... Uh, heavy machine guns and MG42s set up on tripods, for instance, uh, how they're represented in the game. Talks about artillery, talks about cavalry. Uh, and then we get into the troop quality. Now, there, I believe there's five, one, two, three, four, five different qualities of troops in this game, and two subcategories, uh, which can also define a troop type. So you could have regular troops, who are, in this case, aggressive. 
these are the subtypes, aggressive and battle-hardened. Uh, and these are the five basic troop types, elites, veteran, regular, inexperienced militia. These are your morale grades and training grades in the game, basically. Uh, and like I said, there's two subcategories that troops can be uh, divided up into. And then we're going into the battle preparation. These are all the steps to follow before you begin turn one of the game. So it tells you how many uh, uh, company headquarters you get, how to organize your army, all this stuff. The step-by-step -step procedure you follow before you start turn one. Uh, like, for instance, the first thing you do is you establish the battle group composition and troop qualities. Next, determine the number of company HQs. And so on, right down to the tenth part, which is begin turn one. So that's what this section, Chapter 3, is all about, preparing for your battle. Let's take a look. Battle preparation. Now, the first thing it does is it gives you a 10-step sequence here to follow to set up your battle. It starts off with establishing the battle group composition and troop quality. Now, again, the battle group is a term used to describe your army, basically, which is a battalion-sized organization, although it can be smaller. Uh, and then it goes through the 10 steps before you get into turn one of the game. And uh, that's what this chapter goes into. How to uh, determine the number of uh, company HQs, the break point of the armies, which uh, we'll get into later. Uh, Off-board artillery missions, the terrain that you're going to be using in the game, uh, as well as concealed deployment. Uh, you can have concealed units de uh, deployed for the defender and the attacker as well. Uh, there is an advanced rule here where the attacker will use Fog of War cards, and I won't go into details about this, but it's enough to know that this game does make use of hidden deployment and hidden movement. Uh, you don't have to use them, in my opinion, especially if you're playing solo. It may or may not be useful for you to use this section on hidden troops, but it does normally have it as part of the game system, and it tells you how to spot them and, and reveal those hidden units on the tabletop. Talks about deploying your forces and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we get into the meat of the game. Now, this is the game turn, chapter four, and this describes the sequence of you know, chapter four. And this is a lot of the meat of the game is right here. Now, it's not an I go, you go system, like Flames of War, for instance, but it, it's more like, well, like it says here, it's a we both go type of system, which I like. I like that term. It's basically a turn is made up of four phases. You got the headquarters, impetus, and initiative phase, followed by the command phase, and then followed by the exploit phase, and finally the morale phase. Let me zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about here. So you can see all four phases right there. And that's a turn. Uh, looking at them, we got the first phase, which is the headquarters, impetus, and initiative phase. This is where we determine which side goes first. Uh, both sides roll d6, maybe add some modifiers for their command abilities that are re represented by their force that they represent. Uh, and the highest roll wins initiative. The side with initiative gets to decide who will go first in the upcoming command phase. Uh, in addition, the side that wins initiative also gains the exploit phase. As it says here, winner of the initiative only. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But... Uh, once we know who has one initiative, uh, both players add to their rolled totals the number of company headquarters they have in their force, and that gives them their impetus value for the turn. And impetus is used to help you activate units during the game. Uh, during In this game, uh, in order to do anything with a unit or a combat group as it's called, which are the equivalent of like platoon-sized groups, no more than six stands or squads, uh, you have to make an activation roll, and basically you need a seven or greater uh, to activate them. In other words, to do anything with them. And you only get that one chance. And you basically roll 2d6, apply modifiers, and boom. Now, if you roll a four or less, uh, there's a command confusion. You cannot activate the unit, and you cannot change that result. However, if you roll a 5 or 6, a modified 5 or 6, you can add impetus to it, uh, up to two points of impetus, to turn it into a 7, which allows activation. So it, that's how impetus is used in this game. It, you can add up to two points of it to make your die roll a 7. 
to be a successful activation. Otherwise, you fail and you cannot do anything with that unit. So impetus is an important concept to these rules. In fact, these rules are emphasize command and control, and it's through impetus that it reflects that. And we'll get into that more later on in the video. Uh, but after this, we cut into the second phase, which is the command phase. Now again, the side winning initiative determines who will go first in the command phase. And the side going first is termed the phasing player. Uh, basically, the phasing player will activate his units one at a time. Uh, and if successful, he's allowed to do up things like move and move and fire or uh, just fire or close combat or rapid advance, all kinds of nifty little things that he could do with the unit. The opposing player can react to his movements. Uh, note I said movement. Uh, if the opposing player has a unit and the active player moves a unit in his line of sight, he's allowed to react to it. And to do so usually requires that reacting unit to also activate, again, 7+. Plus. And he could use the impetus to help that in a similar way to the active player. And that allows him to either fall back or to shoot at the opposing unit that's in front of him that's moving. So that's how that works, and it's pretty fun. Uh, once the phasing player is done, the player switch roles, and the non-phasing player does the same thing. He starts activating his units, even if they shot as a reaction in the opposing player's uh, command phase. They can still take actions during their command phase, just as normal. And the opposing player, the previous phasing player, is now reacting to his moves. And that's how the game works, basically. That's the meat of it right there. That's where units shoot, fight in close combats, um, activate, and carry out their activities. And this is where impetus plays a big role. It's, it's during your command phase that you use impetus to help activate your units, or call in airstrikes, or call in... Uh, off table, fire, that kind of thing. Uh, bring on reserve units and so on and so forth. That's what the command phase is all about and use impetus to help you do those things. Uh, so if you don't have much impetus in a turn, it's gonna be tough. Uh, but if you got lots, you can do a lot of things. So that's how it works. Finally, we get to phase three. Well, not finally, there is one more phase after this. But the third phase is the exploit phase. And this is something, again, only available to the side that won initiative. Not the side going first. There's nothing to do with that. The side that won initiative uh, during phase one gets the exploit phase. And it basically allows his side uh, to activate freely a, a certain number of units or command groups. Again, up to six separate units as a command group can activate and carry out a move or a fallback or things of that nature. It just it gives them that little extra bonus movement. And the opponent cannot react uh, to those movements. He can't uh, defensive fire or anything like that. So it's a little bonus that he gets. And the number of units that he can do this with is equal to the number of uh, HQ units in his army. That's uh, company command units and his uh, battle group command unit, which both sides always have. Uh, that determines how many they can actually take action with. And finally, we get to the final phase, which is the fourth phase, the morale phase. This is where both sides uh, have an opportunity to rally uh, units that are suppressed, uh, as well as uh, take morale tests for your battle group. Once you've taken 25% losses in units, you're going to have to start making a break test for your side. Um, and this is where that would be done. And eventually, it could result in part of your army falling back off the table. It could result in your H H battle group HQ being sacked. Or it could result in you just giving up the battlefield entirely. So that happens as soon as your side starts taking, has reached 25% losses. Uh, and that happens after the rally portion of the morale phase. Uh, a side that takes 50% losses automatically loses the battle. Uh, that's important to know. There would be no test for that. Uh, so, But once you reach 25% units lost, you've got to start making the break test. And that occurs during the morale phase. So that's the sequence. That's the four phases of the game. Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, it's, it's different, and it's got a lot of action and reaction going on. Um, 
one thing to take note about this is that because both players become phasing players and reacting players, it basically means units can fire more than once. They could fire during their their uh, command phase, and they can also fire as, during the opponent's uh, command phase as a reaction. So it's kind of like you always have two turns to fire, for instance, which I like. It's pretty cool. Uh, so that's the game turn in a nutshell.